Well, good morning, Linwood. So glad to see you all here. We're going to get started. Make your way in. Find a seat. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And as we begin this morning, as always, I'd like to invite everybody to stand with us. So if you're online in the room, let's stand. And let's worship together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before The Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Yeah. 
seated. Good morning, family of families. I'm so glad that you've joined us. And for those online as well, good morning to you. My name is Zach McConnell. I am the next gen and residency pastor here. Uh, I, I just want to pose a question as we start this service. Have you ever felt like you're kind of stuck in a routine? You know, you show up to a Sunday morning service, you go home, if you're like me, we go pick up some pizza, Little Caesars or Domino's, some, one of the two of those things, and then you just do your Monday, you go to work, you do your thing, and then it's just always back to a Sunday morning service, and it just seems very routine. And in, in the service, we talk a lot about our connection card. And why we talk about our connection card is because it hits our DNA. It matches who we are. It matches our vision to be and increasingly become a healthy family of families. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to fill out that connection card, this is for everybody. This is not just for the newcomers. This is not for the, just the millionth people. It is for every single one of us. So if you take an opportunity, fill out that connection card. But I want to turn our attentions in this moment here to Acts chapter 2. This morning, we're going to be participating in communion. So that's a note for those online. If you haven't grabbed your elements yet, go ahead and grab your elements. Hold on to them because we'll participate together. And I pose that question about routine for a specific reason. There's sometimes when we go through faith or go through life, we find ourselves in a spiritual rut. But in Acts chapter 2, something powerful took place. Something we can't really explain, only because it's the act of God himself. The Holy Spirit descends upon the group. And when we participate in communion, this is something that holds attention. It requires us to focus in a little bit more. It's so easy to fall into the routine of participating in communion, but this is our opportunity to engage in it. Here at Linwood Wesleyan Church, we believe that we have an open communion table. All, uh, you don't need to have your name on a membership list. You don't need to be coming here X amount of time. We only have one requirement, that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if that is you, the table is open. 
In a moment, I'm going to ask you to come forward. You're going to grab your elements, and I want you to hold on to your elements. And for those in this middle section, you can come down the middle aisle. For those in this section, you can go down this aisle. And for, the, for this section over here, come down this aisle. Anything's too confusing, just get to the table. I promise you, if you pick the wrong table, it's all the right tables. Just get to the table, grab your elements and hold on to them. But as you're grabbing onto the elements, be reminded of the why behind the bread. Be reminded of the why behind the cup, for we will participate together. Holy Spirit, when we engage in communion, it is an opportunity and a responsibility that we hold very dearly. And so because of these things, we look to Acts chapter 2, and we look at the power of your majesty that took place in that body of Christ. May we experience that even now in our services. May we come together as, as fellow believers, as a fellowship of breaking the bread and engaging in the cup. May this be reminded of our why. We love you, Lord. It's in your name. We all said, amen. Come to the table.
so this takes place after the death of Jesus, after the resurrection of Jesus, after the ascension of Jesus. They were asked this question, what do we do now? And then moments later, the Holy Spirit descends upon a group of people. But I want to lean a little bit more on verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe, and the many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily of those who were being saved. Family of families, the elements that we hold before us isn't just simply a, a ritual we run through, but an opportunity to be interceded. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If we just take a moment, Lord, to just even comprehend that the perfect sacrifice was given on our behalf. That you, Jesus, died on the cross for our sins, fully man and fully God. It's something that we do not deserve, but we're incredibly thankful for. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. And then in the same way, in that same night, Jesus took the cup and he lifted it up and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant's gone. The new covenant is here. The blood shed before you has been made in part for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we're thankful for your words. We're thankful for your truths. And we're thankful that we can continue to be interceded. And so because of these things, as we partake in communion, as we continue to engage in worship, whether that's through song or through breaking in the word, that we stay engaged with you. We break the routine. And we say yes to you, Lord. We say yes to the worship. We say yes to submission. We say yes to you guiding us every single day. We love you. It's in your name we all said amen. sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name. He stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, He took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation.
you with all that we are and with all that we have, God. I pray that you open up our hearts to receive your message, Lord. I pray that we take it to heart and we make your path for us actionable, God, that we trust in what you have in store for us, that your plan for us is all good in the best possible way for us, God. We love you so much and we worship you in your most precious name. Amen. You may be seated.
morning with a question. I like the way Pastor Zach started us out with a question uh, before communion. And I'm going to ask you a question as well. So get your hands ready. I love to see how many. Uh, raise your hand if you have used the word dissipation in the last week. Anybody? Yeah, me neither, right? Uh, in fact, I had to look it up when I came across it a couple weeks ago. I was reading through my Banding Together reading plan, Luke 21. I see this word dissipation. I know I've read the New Testament in that translation many times, but dissipation just never really gripped me. So I'm like, okay, I can pick this up on context. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe I want to look a little deeper. So I look it up in a dictionary, and I was so glad that I did. Uh, it was a reminder to me that God's Word is living and active, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it is not static. It is not a dead book. It is an a live book. And I love it when I'm just reading along, not thinking about a sermon, not prepping for a sermon, just reading God's Word, because I love God's Word, and then He gives me something really good for a sermon. I'm like, yes, that'll work. That'll preach. That's good stuff. And so I want to ask you to turn to Luke 21. If you're joining us online, man, we're so glad that you are with us online. These words will be on the screen behind me, but I would also invite you to open up a Bible uh, on, you know, on a device or if you can have a paper Bible, um, that's even better. If you need a Bible, if you're in the sanctuary and you don't have a Bible but you want one, there's blue Bibles in the seats in front of you. And uh, you can open up to Luke chapter 21 where Jesus actually warns his disciples against dissipation. Let's look at what he says here. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. That day being the day of judgment, the day uh, when the current heaven and earth pass away. And it's interesting, Jesus warns against this dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And so you can pick up a lot by context, but when I looked up the word, I found some interesting things that this idea of dissipation and the Greek word that is translated as dissipation uh, means to be dispersed and diluted. Uh, maybe you've seen the Lord of the Rings when Bilbo says he's starting to feel a little thin, like too little butter over too much bread. He's feeling dissipated. Okay, he didn't say it that way, but that's how he's feeling. Anybody feel a little stretched, a little thin, like too little butter over too much bread? It also means being wasteful or intemperate, self-indulgent. You kind of put all that together. You add to it the drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And this idea, this word picture of fragmentation came to mind. Don't let your hearts be weighed down by being fragmented, pulled in all these different directions. And so it's a warning that I think we really need. It's a warning that fits in really, really well with our current topic, our series here on the Pace of Grace. It's, it's a warning that we need to heed in our current culture where we are bombarded with opportunities and with things and with expectations. And if you are going to be such and such, you need to have such and such and you need to do such and such. And if we're not careful, we end up with our hearts weighed down, fragmented, dissipated. And the anxieties of life can be overwhelming. And I'm not just talking about stuff or materialism. I think that's very much in view. But there's also the activities and the commitments and the things that we pursue as a lifestyle. Now, Christian speaker and author Alan Fadling has said that the drive to possess is an engine for hurry. Think about that for a minute. As we think about walking at the pace of grace, as we think about ruthlessly eliminating hurry from our lives, this is a very poignant perspective that the drive to possess, and not just stuff, sometimes it's stuff, but maybe it's a lifestyle. Maybe it's the drive to possess a lifestyle, a standard of living, a certain opinion that others would have of us. We want to possess that. We want that for ourselves. This is an engine for hurry. It's something that produces or adds or accelerates hurry in our lives. And so a good question would be, what do I want right now and how hard am I willing to work for it? And maybe it's a thing. Maybe it's a newer car or a bigger house or the new technology. I thought it was an iPhone 14. My kids corrected me. No, it's an iPhone 15 now, Dad. And I was like, I'm really glad I don't know that. That, that tells me I'm doing something right because I used to know and I used to want I'm rolling with this 10 as long as it'll go. 
But how much are you willing to trade for that? How much of your life are you willing to give to that? And this is easy if you're working. You just figure out your hourly wage, and you say, okay, my hourly wage is $20 an hour just for easy math, because we all like easy math, right? And if an iPhone 15 costs $1,200, it might be more. I don't know. But you just do the math. You say, okay, am I willing to give 60 hours of my life to buy that thing? And if you're going to subscribe to something, this gets even more. If you're going to buy a car that has a $600 a month payment, and you say, am I going to give 30 hours a month of my life for that car? This is a really important and good question to ask if we're in that season of life. If you're retired, you might be looking at a major purchase, and you could do the math and say, how many years of my working life is that thing going to cost me? And just do the math. It's, it's worth doing, even if you go and buy it. It's worth doing the exercise and to be aware and not just thinking about money or time, but say, how much hurry is that going to add to my life? Now, I'm not against enjoying possessions and experiences, and I don't think Jesus is either, but I do think it behooves us to ask the question and to consider how how much am I really going to enjoy that? Because trillions of dollars are spent to make you dissatisfied with the thing you just worked and saved to own so because they want you to own something else. Or the place you just went on vacation, they want you to go somewhere else. Like all this money is being spent, and so often we don't even enjoy the thing that we were so set on for very long because something else comes along. And do we really count the cost, not just the money, but the time and the hurry? And all of this kind of combines this warning of Jesus to show us there's really a lot to be said for intentionally choosing simplicity. Simplicity. That's what we're talking about today. We're in a series titled The Pace of Grace. We're almost done with this. Some of you can't wait for this series to be over. It's like, man, you're really poking the bruises, Pastor. I'm tired of you stepping on my toes. Um, And some of you are like, man, this has been really good. This has caused me to reflect, to make some changes, to adjust my schedule or my mindset on some things. It started as sort of a progressive series, so if you're joining us late, I would really encourage you to go to our YouTube page, go to our Facebook page, go to our podcast, our Church Center app. There's all kinds of ways for you to get this content, but listen to those earlier messages where we talk about the problem of hurry. We talk about the solution that Jesus offers. In these last couple of weeks, we've really been focusing on four key disciplines that we can observe in Jesus' life that help us to unhurry, help us to move at the pace of of grace. Grace has a pace. Love has a pace, and it is not a hurried pace. So a couple weeks ago, we looked at silence and solitude and reflected on this idea that without solitude, it's virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. You can live a fleshly life without solitude, but you can't live a spiritual life with God in communion and fellowship with Him and with Jesus without solitude. Last week, we looked at the Sabbath, and we focused on Jesus' words that the man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It's a gift God wants us to have. It's a gift that he wanted his people to have after they had spent generations in Egypt as human machinery. That's what Pharaoh's idea for them was. And God says, I've got a different idea. I'm over Pharaoh. I'm above him. And I have a different way that I want you to live and move and have your being in this world. And it involves rest. So I have a gift for you. It's a Sabbath. Not one day a year, not one day a month, one day a week. You get to have a birthday every week. That's what God is saying. It's give life to you. It's something you should look forward to. Plan ahead. Carve out time for rest, for worship, for a subtle resistance to Pharaoh's ways. And so today we're focusing on a third discipline, a discipline of simplicity. You might not necessarily think of simplicity as a spiritual discipline, but it is something that we can choose to do that will bring us closer to God, something that will help us move in His direction. And that's what spiritual disciplines are. And maybe you notice that the worship set was even a little bit more simple today. That was intentional. I love that Michael had that idea, one acoustic guitar, three voices, I don't know about you, but it worked for me. I was a mess down there in the front row. Somebody moved my Kleenex, too. I thought I had, I probably am the one that moved my Kleenex. I probably threw it away between services, but I needed it. And did you notice that the songs even echoed this really important truth that says, whom the sun sets free, he is free indeed. It was in the early set. 
where we declared that we were children of God, and it was in the post-communion song where we celebrated what has been done for us on that rugged cross, and that we are free. Jesus, it's a quote from John 8. Jesus really wants us to experience freedom, and I guarantee you there is more freedom in simplicity than there is in complexity. We have to fight for it because everything in the culture is moving us toward complexity, hurry, have more, get more, do more. And so this is an important subject for us today. And I think as we look in the Gospels, everything that we can tell, this was a key discipline of Jesus. He had very few possessions, particularly during the time of his earthly ministry, those last three or so years of his life. He had no permanent residence. He moved around. He lived a semi-nomadic life. He had no means of transportation, no horse, no carriage. He wasn't carried around on one of those little things that the slaves have to carry important people around. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. You think he wasn't entitled to those things? He rejected them on purpose. He chose a simple life. He had no visible means of financial security. And yet, it's not because he couldn't. There's growing idea that, that Jesus had wealthy patrons. He had enough resources for his ministry that they chose a treasurer. Now, you might disagree with who he chose if you know the story, but there was enough there that Judas could help himself and people wouldn't notice. So I think he chose simplicity import, intentionally. He chose that there would be enough to help those that were in need to not be tied down, bogged down. He chose and he embraced a simple life, and he chose to be dependent upon others. And that's one thing that we don't want very much in our current culture and way of life. We don't want to be dependent on someone else. We want to make it on our own. Jesus chose to be dependent upon others. And he also taught. We don't just have to speculate from looking at his life and sort of fill in the gaps. He taught about money and possessions all the time. One scholar has said as much as 38% of his parables and teachings have some relationship to our relationship with money, with possessions, with the things that really drive us. And so we're going to look at a lengthy teaching session about money and possessions uh, in Luke chapter 12. You just have to flip back a few pages. But I want to read you this quote from John Mark Comer because I think it, it sort of encapsulates uh, a couple of really key ideas really well that we want to hold in our mind as we go through this. He says, in Jesus' life and teaching, we see the very same tension that runs all the way through the library of Scripture. On the one hand, the world and everything in it are very good and are meant to be enjoyed and shared with those in need. On the other hand, too much wealth is dangerous. It has the potential to pull our hearts away from God. And when that happens, our greedy, off-kilter hearts wreak havoc, not only on our own lives, sabotaging our own happiness, but more importantly, on others' lives, widening the gap between rich and poor. What he's saying is that when we are focused on a get more for me, have it my way, get more, accumulate, 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 then we're less willing to share with those who are in need, who do not have as much. We might even take advantage on them, intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously. And that is a stark contrast from the words that Pastor Zach read from Acts chapter 2, another fun little Holy Spirit connection there. They sold their possessions and gave to any as he had need. And that's not just a sidelight in Acts. It was so important to Luke, this community, that he mentions that multiple times as he goes through the early chapters. And he gives specific examples of how people did that in order to meet the needs that they had. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 12. These are pretty much all red letter words that we're looking at today. These are directly from the mouth of Jesus. You want to know what Jesus thinks about these things? Luke chapter 12 is a really good place to look. It's a lengthy teaching section on money and possessions, and it begins with a question, as is often the case with Jesus. People asked him questions, and he usually responded with a question and then some teaching or some context. And so in this case, in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who am I? Who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Now, I always read that, and I'm like, Man! Who appointed me? I, I, that's the way I read it. I don't think Jesus said it that way. I think he was a little more dignified. Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Now, they're leveraging Jesus' authority. And his response tells us a lot about the context. Because he had divine insight into why this person was asking this question. 
Because then he said to them, to everyone listening, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So his response gives insight into the question behind the question or the issue behind the issue. Now, for just a little bit of context, the Old Testament uh, way that wealth was transferred from one generation to another was that it would go to the male sons, the sons of, of the generation, would go to the next generation, and the firstborn male would get a double portion. And so by speculation, there's at least two brothers here, and the one is saying, tell that one that got a double share to, to share it evenly. Tell him to be generous, Jesus. Isn't that what you've been teaching all along? And Jesus knows the insight that greed is really what's at work here. And he says, watch out. Be on your guard. That's basically saying the same thing. Watch out and watch out. Be on your guard and be on your guard. Watch out. Because greed is sneaky. It will find its way in. It will come in through the back door, even if you have the front door locked. It will sneak in through that window that you left open just a crack for a little fresh air. It will find its way into your life. He's saying, watch out for it. Be on your guard for it. Not, he's not warning them against having a lot. He's warning them against greed. And there's a difference. Because you can have a lot and not be greedy, and you can have nothing and not be greedy. Or you can have a lot and be very greedy, or you can have very little and be very greedy. You see, money is morally neutral. It just makes you more of what you already were. So if you're a very generous, open person, and you don't have much, and you get a lot, you're going to be very open and generous with what you get. And if you are a selfish, greedy person and you don't have much and you get a lot of money, guess what? You're going to be even more selfish and greedy when you get a lot. And so Jesus isn't talking about possessions and money as the problem. He's talking about greed. Greed is a word that is often translated as covetousness. It's wanting more. It's a desire for more and more and more. Like many appetites, greed is an appetite that is never fully and finally satisfied. The greed doesn't go away because you get more. In fact, it usually gets greater. And now I have more, and so I'm anxious about the more that I have. And I want to get even more because there's always somebody that has more than I have. And so I want more, and I desire more, and then I get more, and I want more. It's a desire. It's, a, it's an appetite that's never fully or finally satisfied. And he says, be on your guard. Watch out be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And I would say even good kinds, even the ones that seem like, well, that's actually a good thing, right? We should want more of that, right? He's saying if it's more than you need, then be on your guard against greed, against coveting what other people have when you already have enough, against wanting your brother's share of the inheritance, right, wrong, or indifferent. Now, the next few verses, next six verses, verse 16 through 21, he tells a parable. He tells a story. He often did this to illustrate a point. We're not going to look at the parable in great detail, but it really drives this point home. It's a parable of the rich fool, this guy who has a really good harvest, and it's more than he can hold. And so instead of giving the excess away, being generous, helping the poor, giving to God and to his ministry, he says, let's tear down all the barns we have, and let's build bigger barns, and then we'll be set for life. And he doesn't know that his life is going to be taken from him that very night. And Jesus concludes by saying that's what it is to not be rich toward God. That we're to be rich toward God first and foremost. And then I want to look at verse 22 and 23 together because we're told then Jesus said to his disciples, and it's a therefore. You know what you're supposed to do with the therefores, right? You circle them and you look at what was just said. And you ask, why was the therefore? What's the therefore, therefore? What is it telling me? Jesus is making the application clear. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. And he's connecting greed and worry and the accumulation and being really preoccupied with that. That's what worry means, to be preoccupied with. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about even these basic necessities. Don't worry about it. And he's connecting money and greed with anxiety. He's saying life is so much more than food or clothes. It's so much more than the necessities, and therefore it's so much more than all the other stuff too. I think he starts with the necessities on purpose. These are not luxury items. Food to eat, clothes to wear, that's kind of at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? It's like food, water, clothes, 
We're not talking about the top levels. We're just talking about the basic necessities. And so by extension, it's everything else. Because if we're not supposed to worry about the food and the clothes that we absolutely need, then we're certainly not supposed to worry about getting the latest iPhone or a newer car or all of these other things. He gives a couple of examples about the birds that they don't really worry about their food. The Heavenly Father knows they need food, so they eat. They don't. Then he looks at the lilies. He says, they didn't do anything to make themselves beautiful. The Heavenly Father clothed them in beauty. And so if we're not supposed to worry about those things, then we're certainly not to worry about other things. That's where the dissipation comes in. That's where the fragmentation comes in. That's where the drunkenness, the excess, the anxieties of life come in, especially if these things are beyond our current means, because that's when we start scheming, isn't it? It's like, I can't afford that, but I really want that. So how am I going to get that? And we start that game, and maybe we take on debt, which there are a lot of scriptural warnings against debt. Or we work longer hours, we overwork, or we take a job or a promotion that we don't really want into a position that we don't really want that has demands on our time or sends us on travel that we don't really want to do in order to have a lifestyle, in order to possess something. Or we just become more selfish and we say, well, I really want that thing. Church just sent me my giving statement for the year. If I just dialed that down just a little bit, I could afford this thing. And as soon as I have that, then I'll turn it back up, right? And we can play those games that we weren't meant to play. And Jesus is warning us strongly against those. And so after he gives us a couple of examples in verse 29 through 31, he says, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. That's the second time he's told us not to worry in this passage. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. You know what that word father is translated as? The Hebrew word Abba. It means source and sustainer. This verse is really important when you when you read and you substitute Father with your source and sustainer, listen to what it says here. It says, your source and sustainer knows that you need them. Your source, your sustainer, he knows. Why are you going to worry about something that your source and your sustainer knows that you need? And then he says, seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. He says, don't set your heart on it. God knows you need it. Seek him first. And so much falls into place in our lives when we get these priorities right, when we seek him and his kingdom first, when we trust him deeply. So many things fall into place in our lives, and so much worry leaves our life. And as I was thinking about that and reflecting on that while I was preparing this, somebody actually came in right then, or I noticed it right then. Somebody sent me a Tim Keller quote, and it reminded me of another Tim Keller quote. It's a particularly profoundly annoying Tim Keller quote that I want to share with you because I love you, right? Here's what Tim Keller said, and this this was a gut punch for me the first time I heard it. For most of us, God hasn't become our happiness. We therefore pray to procure things for our happiness and not to know him better. Yeah. Imagine the position that puts God in His child is asking him for something, and he knows that thing's not going to make you as happy as you think it's going to make you. In fact, I'm the only thing that can make you as happy as you think that thing is going to make you. And so God has to say no to us sometimes. The things that we're asking, they're not necessarily bad things. They're just not him. And we're asking for this thing that will bring us happiness from the person that will bring us happiness. But we're not asking for him. This is a really important quote, one you might want to take a picture of or you might want to write down and you might want to put it somewhere that it can annoy you and convict you on a regular basis like it does me. Now it's a little bit more like a tap on the shoulder when I start to really want something that I don't really need. It's like a tap on the shoulder. It's like God's saying, remember, that's not going to make you happy. Not the way I'm going to make you happy. I don't know that you really need that. Maybe you just need a little bit more time with me. Maybe you don't need that thing. Maybe what you need is to spend time, to get away with me to a quiet place and rest. And I love the way he chooses to close close this section. Verses 32 through 34. Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock. That's number three. Three times in this section he tells them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father, your source and sustainer, 
has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He just told him to seek it. And now he says it's his pleasure, his good pleasure to give it to you. Go ahead, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys, no economic downturn eliminates. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I wonder if it breaks God's heart when we don't really seem to want the kingdom that it is his good pleasure to give to us. Now keep in mind, kingdom there is not a political kingdom. It's the order and authority. He's saying, seek first the rule and reign of God in your life. And all this other stuff is going to be added to you. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What could we possibly want that's better than the kingdom? And when we desire it, when we seek it, when we go after it, full bore, he wants us to have it. He gives it to us. Because he wants us to be free. He wants us to experience his freedom. And he wants our heart to be with him. He wants our hearts. And that's why Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so I wonder, are our hearts light and free in heaven? Or are they weighed down with dissipation here on earth? And all of this brings us to simplicity. (laughs) Don't worry, we're not at the halfway point. Okay, we're coming down the home stretch. John Mark Comer poses the question at the transition point in the chapter on simplicity. He says, you know, here's a crazy idea. What if Jesus was right? (laughs) And I love the question because sometimes we're reading and we're like, well, that might have been good for you, Jesus, or that might have been good 2,000 years ago, or that might have been good in this other season or time in the world. But what if he was right like all the time? What if he was right for you? What if he was right for me? What if Jesus was right? What if simplicity, choosing less over more, really was the best way, really is the best way? What if it really is for us? Now, simplicity simply means choosing less over more, choosing less stuff, fewer activities, fewer commitments over more stuff, community activities, commitments. Recently, it's sort of been confused with a designer style. I don't think that's what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about is what you would see on HGTV. And this is a modern simplicity style, feng shui, or some other idea that is sort of has the guise of simplicity. It's meant to help you relax and enjoy simplicity. And, and it shows that it can be aesthetically pleasing. That simplicity doesn't mean insignificance either. Like sometimes if it's a simple message, it has one point that drives home differently than a complex message. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes simplicity is actually more profound and more powerful. It doesn't mean poverty or destitution, and it doesn't mean endless organization. Sometimes simplicity starts to look like, well, what if all the bins were white and they matched and the shelf was just full of bins and so you couldn't see any of the stuff? That would be simplicity. Well, you could go spend a couple grand chasing simplicity and you still got all the stuff to manage. So it's, it's not that. It's choosing less over more. And it's interesting that poor people don't call it simple living, do they? They just call it living. (laughs) They didn't choose simplicity. They didn't have another option. So there is some idea that there's an option. You have to choose. But when you choose less over more, you're choosing simplicity. And that can be a spiritual discipline that brings us closer to the heart of God. And it's interesting when you think about this, that poor people just call it living. Every time I've been on a mission trip with people, every time I've talked to people that came back from a mission trip where they were around impoverished people, and I'm not just talking about like American poor, I'm talking about like poor, poor, less than $2 a day, poor, nothing poor. And they always comment on, man, they got nothing but joy. They got all the joy in the world. They're so happy. They're so light. They don't know where their next meal is coming from, but they are so joyful. I remember we took uh, tennis balls on a trip to Nicaragua. We took used tennis balls. Somebody worked at a, at a gym where they had tennis. And, you know, apparently when you use a tennis ball for a while, you got to get rid of it. They were going to throw away all these tennis balls. We took them down there. We gave used tennis balls to kids that had nothing, and they were as excited as they had ever been. They couldn't believe that they had their own tennis ball. They didn't have to share. It was amazing. And so simplicity is choosing less over more. It's similar to minimalism, but Minimalism can start to become an end in itself. Like, I want to get less and less and less for the purpose of having less and less and less. Simplicity is a spiritual discipline that is designed to be a means to an end. Like all the disciplines, it's a means to an end. It's a practice that brings us closer to the heart of God. 
It's only helpful if it's bringing us closer to the heart of God. And so you might say, well, I don't really want to do simplicity. I'll come back next week. Maybe I'll like that one better. No, I'll like experiment with this. Play with this. Pray with about this. Like, what would it look like for me to choose less over more? And recognize you don't have to get there all at once. Do what you can until you can do what you couldn't. Do what you can that helps you to be more close to God, more focused on Him, more available to Him and His purpose for your life, because so often the complexity of life pulls us away from Him and pulls us away from His purpose for our life. And so the goal of simplicity is to free up resources, to free up time, to free up energy, and to make that available to Him, to His purposes, to His kingdom. That's the goal. That's why we call it a spiritual discipline. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about how you can cultivate simplicity in your life. I don't want to tell you all about it and tell you to go do it and not tell you how to do it. So I have some ideas. Some of these come from the book. Some of these are my own. The first would be to pray a lot more. Pray more. Like every time you're going to say yes to something, every time you're going to buy something, just pray. Say, should I really get that? Would Jesus get that? Is that really the best use of my time, my money? Will that add hurry to my life? There's some questions, the ways that you could pray about this and cultivate simplicity in your life. First, consider the true cost of things. Not just the dollars and cents, but the true cost. How much time is it going to cost to purchase that? How many working hours? Or how much time is it going to cost to manage that? Like if I buy that thing, now I've got to maintain that thing. Now I've got to use that thing or I've wasted my money on that thing. Do I really want to have that thing? Measure not just in money and time, but in hurry. How much hurry will that add to my life? The next one would be just live on a budget. This will help a lot on simplicity and live on a budget that has margin. Live on a budget that doesn't spend everything. You know, the whole 80-10-10, live on 80%, save 10%, give 10%. You might be in a have the resources to do like 60, 20, 20, or, or something like that. Like 80, 10, 10 is kind of the minimum. Everybody should strive to get there. Where we're not living on 90 or 100%, we're giving to God, we're returning to Him a portion of what He's given to us. We're saving some, and we're living on the rest and being generous. Never impulse buy. <laughs> That kind of goes along with living on a budget. Like set a 24-hour rule or I have to talk to at least two people before and I have to tell them why I want that and they are entitled to ask me, why do you really want that? How long are you going to want that? What is that going to do for you that not having it won't do for you? Maybe you go ahead and get it anyway, but it's good to have the conversation. Share, rent, and borrow whenever you can. Like really? I know we don't want to be dependent on other people. That's kind of the American way is that you have your own but I had to make a kind of a quick road trip, longer than I expected, um, that I hadn't been planning on. And I had about 1,600 miles on the road in the course of two days. And I was noticing how many trucks had one person riding in the truck, nothing in the back of the truck, no trailer. Did some simple math, paid attention to it for about 20 minutes, and it was like 90, 95% of the trucks had one person, nothing in the bed, no trailer. And I'm not picking on truck owners. like. I want a truck. I even told my whole church that I wanted a Toyota Tundra, and I didn't get one for Christmas. That's okay. I don't need a Toyota Tundra. I really don't. I didn't pray for it. I just threw it out there. Right? But what am I going to do with the Toyota Tundra? I'm going to drive it just like I drive my Toyota Camry, back and forth on 57th Street from house to church, house to church, house to church, maybe three times a year. I need a truck. I can borrow one. I know people that have one. Don't use it very often. Or I could go to rent one for a day, and it would be a lot less than owning one. Like, these, these are just ideas. I'm, again, I'm not picking on truck owners. I know there's a lot of truck owners. Enjoy your truck. I might need to borrow your truck someday. <laughs> Next thing you could do is give stuff away. Give a lot of stuff away. We have so much stuff. Imagine you had to move right now. Like, you found out you got to move in two weeks. How much stuff would you give away? You would give a lot of stuff away. What's telling you you can't give it away right now? If you're not going to need it, if you're going to move in two weeks, do you really need it right now? We do this exercise every now and then. It's usually motivated and brought on by my wife. It's not something that comes to mind for me, but it's good. We give a lot of stuff away. You can even give nice stuff away. Did you know that? It doesn't even have to just be your garbage. You can give away really nice stuff. You can give a really nice stuff away to the Union Gospel Mission to bless somebody who really needs that thing that you don't use very often, don't really need to have anymore. It's taking up space. And you'll find it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's Scripture, too. It really is. 
you could cultivate a deep appreciation for nature, for simple pleasures. Did you recognize nature is free? I know it's not accessible much of the time in this part of the country, in this part of the year, but for the other nine months, nature is alarmingly affordable. You don't even have to like go anywhere. I drive up and down 57th Street to get to my house, get to the church. I can take two right turns off of 57th Street and I can be at the outdoor campus, which is like this 20, 30 acre park right in the middle of town. And I can walk on the paths and I can enjoy nature and it doesn't cost me a cent. You could drop 36 bucks on a park's pass and have a blast and go for picnics that don't cost you anything because you're probably gonna eat lunch. Like we could cultivate a deep appreciation for nature and for simple pleasures and this would bring simplicity into our lives and we might even encounter God and hear him speak in nature. Last thing would just intentionally do less. Even allow yourself the privilege of doing nothing for a while. I was so blessed to see somebody waiting for service last week, sitting by themselves, no phone out, just sitting, looking ahead, doing nothing. I thought, that's really cool. You almost never see that anymore. You never see people doing nothing. You go to a waiting room, they got their phones out. You go to a restaurant, they got their phones out. Or maybe they're talking to somebody, but just to do nothing for a little while. Give yourself pockets in your day where you do nothing. Say no sometimes. Choose fewer activities, fewer commitments, and enjoy the ones that you have more. The last thing I'll say is a quote from, uh, from Richard Foster in Celebration of Discipline. He's talking about St. Francis of Assisi and his followers, and he says this. He says, lead a cheerful, happy revolt against the spirit of materialism. Don't you love that? I see people smiling. You're like, that sounds like so much fun. <laughs> I want to join that revolution. Lead a cheerful, happy revolt revolt against the spirit of materialism. It doesn't have to be this, <sighs> fine, Pastor Mark preached about it, I'll give something away. That's not a cheerful, happy revolt against the spirit of materialism. It's not a grudging thing. If you do this, you'll find it's more blessed to give than receive, and, and you will find that when you're pursuing him and his kingdom first, that's better than pursuing all this other stuff and having your hearts weighed down by dissipation. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is a question this week. It's a question that as you pray to cultivate simplicity in your life that I want to ask you to ask this question on a regular basis. The question is this, what would Jesus do if he were me? This is a question that if you'll ask it 20, 30 times a day, it will radically change your life. Even if you don't do what comes to mind right away, if you just keep asking the question, Keep asking the question. This is called self-awareness. If you keep asking the question, eventually you'll have a desire to do what Jesus would do if he were you. And this is called discipleship. And it will lead you to a simpler life. If we will ask the question, what would Jesus do if he were me? Maybe he would do that. Maybe he wouldn't. But whatever it is, challenge yourself to ask that question. Put it on your phone. Tell your phone to remind you to ask this question multiple times throughout the day, what would Jesus do if he were me? You can even, like, abbreviate it to just the initials. So what would Jesus do if he were me? And you ask that question, and then you ask it again, and you ask it again, and you start to do what Jesus would do if he were you, and you'll live a simpler life. I, I really believe it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are so good and that you love us so much, and you want us to experience freedom so much. And we're reminded, Lord, that our freedom cost you greatly. That it mattered that much. That you were willing to literally lay down your lives for us to experience the freedom that you want us to have. You came that we would have life. That it would be a rich and satisfying life. Not a life where our hearts are weighed down, fragmented, filled with the anxieties. Help us to choose you over that. Help us to remember the cost, the price that you paid for our freedom and to choose to live in deeper communion and fellowship with you and to choose simplicity as a means to a deeper walk with you, a closer walk with you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we respond?
gave you life for mine Nailed to the cross you crucified All my sin and shame It was washed by your mercy You are the treasure I find my reason for living so let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy all praise to the lord most high all praise to the one who saved my life all praise to Jesus Christ, High King of Heaven, my King forever. You stormed the gates of my heart, the veil in between was torn apart. You hold the keys to the grave Cause you bring things to life And you roll stones away All praise to the Lord most high All praise to the one who saved my life All praise to Jesus Christ High King of Heaven I keep forever. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down for you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down. My hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down for you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down is for you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down for you. Lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. My whole life now is for you. All praise to the Lord most high. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven. My King forever, all praise to the Lord Most High, all praise to the One who saved my life, all praise to Jesus Christ, my King of Heaven, my King forever. My King forever. I want to invite you, especially if you didn't raise your hands up, but you kind of wanted to as we were singing that bridge. I want to invite you to raise your hands up now. If you agree with this prayer, if you can say this from the heart, I want you to pray with me as we begin and just say, Lord, I lift up my hands to you in surrender. I lay my life down before you. I believe you are right, that your way is right, that you love me and your path for me is best. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we lay our hands and our lives down before you, we thank you that you are good, that you love us, that it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. So help us to desire it. Help us to seek it. Help us to choose wisely as we make decisions and to choose and make decisions that will bring us closer to you and to your heart, that will bring us closer to your kingdom. 
As we give now and participate in the offering, may we do so with glad and sincere hearts, eager to see your kingdom expand through our participation, through our generosity to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, not that I'm in a hurry, but I understand that the speaker ran a little long. Don't worry, I'm going to talk to him about that. Um, but there's a couple things that are really important that you need to know. One is Love on Cleveland. We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. All the cards have gone out, which is awesome, as long as all the cards come back with the stuff. So even though we were preaching about simplicity, you have my permission to go shopping. If you haven't gotten your stuff yet for that card, please bring it back. Bring the card back with you so that we can get it to the right uh, teacher in the right classroom over at Cleveland Elementary. If you're coming to the Seniors on the Go event tomorrow, you can bring those items with you if you haven't already. We're excited to put it all out on a table. The principal from Cleveland Elementary is going to be here speaking to our seniors, and, and we want to show her all the stuff that's about to come to their school to help them teach the children. So uh, if you're part of that, don't forget to come, and don't forget to bring your stuff, uh, your tag with the stuff uh, as well. I also want to talk to you about this postcard that was on the seats as you came in. Maybe it wasn't on your seat, but it's on a seat close to you. This town hall meeting that is coming up in a couple of weeks. Our local board of administration has been assessing, based on some feedback that we received, some questions that we received, and some pain points that we noticed in our kitchens and the way that we use our kitchens. How could we really optimize our kitchens uh, to make them really function well and function and serve the, the spaces around them well. So we created a team. That team has been working, uh, going back and forth with the LBA, and we're excited to share with you in sort of a town hall setting uh, in a couple of weeks what we have come up with, the plans that we have. And so this is an invitation to you. Take the postcard. There's a QR code. We need you to register. Just like everything else, we need you to register. And if you know you're going to be there today, go ahead and register today. Uh, don't wait. Um, but we'll have a lunch together, we'll have a meal of fellowship together, and then we'll share together about that. And it's an opportunity for you to ask questions and get those questions answered. So that's our town hall meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I hope that you'll be a part of that if you're interested in that. Also on the back side of that is our... If all you have to have is a smartphone or an iPad, tablet, whatever, and you can get that. You can sign up for events, you can look and see what's coming, you can watch sermons, you can do it all right there. So that's on there as well. As we close our service today, uh, we were planning to commission uh, Pastor Keith and Sandra as they prepare to go on their next mission trip to Nepal, um, but they got delayed on their way back uh, into town, and so they're going to get here this afternoon. I said, we're going to pray for you anyway. I hope you don't mind. They were very happy uh, that we would do that. So I'll close um, our service in prayer. That'll sort of be our benediction, um, and be remembering them in prayer. I believe they leave on Tuesday or Wednesday uh, to take their next trip to Nepal to raise up the church in Nepal. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Keith and Sandra for our, their presence here among us as a part of our family of families and for their commitment and their passion for taking the gospel outside not only our church or our community but outside our country as they go to Nepal and they seek to invest in church leaders and to raise up new leaders. God, may you just bless every part of that trip. Bless their going, get them safe, help their travels to go smoothly. We pray that their time in Nepal would be very, very fruitful for your purposes. Keep them safe as they travel about the country. And as they pour into and invest in leaders, God, would you just really anoint and empower them and empower those leaders to go and to carry that message forward. And then bring them back safely to us, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you go. Have a victorious week in Christ. We'll see you again very soon.